Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Paul Sweeney, along with Tom Keen. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, geopolitics, finance, and investment. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show. Weekday mornings from 7 to 10 Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. Liz Ann Saunders, she's not sitting on $189 billion of cash. She puts it to work. Liz Ann Saunders, <laughs> Chief Investment Strategist for Charles Schwab. I don't know, Liz Ann, if, if you were sitting on $189 billion of cash this morning, what would you do with it? Oh, Bill and Chill, I kind of agree <laughs> yeah. with that. But, but you know, the, the real answer to that, and uh, leaving, leaving Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway aside, you know, we also have uh, a decent size in terms yep. of client assets at $9.1 trillion. But yep. the answer to <laughs> asset allocation, how much to have in cash, that's obviously specific to each investor. There's there's no sort of blanket comment about that. But there's income and fixed income, and, and the, the, therein lies um, the, this story. So therein lies the story, Liz. It's great to see you. Um, so, Lizanne, where does that leave us then? How long does that story go on for? Well, I think, you know, key to the equity market is more on the longer end of the bond spectrum. You've seen this pretty tight inverse relationship between the 10-year yield and the U.S. equity market. And, and the really acute inverse correlation dates back to the middle part of last year when you saw the big move up in the 10-year yield from sub 4% to 5% from late July to late October. And that led to almost in, during the exact same period of time, a 10% correction in the S&P. 12% in the NASDAQ. And then, of course, yields started to move down. And the early part of that move down, it was to the benefit of equal weight. It was to the benefit of small caps. And then when you saw the yield move up from 3.8 to more recently 4.7, the first part of that was largely to the detriment of smaller cap stocks of equal weight sort of down the spectrum but then when you got up to the four seven it obviously caused some trouble for the market more broadly now i think we're back in that more nuanced part of the cycle where moves up and down in yields is likely to have more of a direct impact down the cap spectrum where you have the zombie companies the companies that are more at the mercy of what happens with yields you know you've been reporting on it a lot this morning many of the larger companies earn more interest on their cash than they pay interest on, on debt. So I still think that the bond market is in large part in the driver's seat for the equity market, market even more so than this parlor game of when's the Fed you know, going to cut rates, uh, when's the first meeting, and, and, and how, uh, how quickly and how many. Lizanne, we're, I guess, about 80% away through the earnings for the S&P 500 yep. here. Any, any takeaways for you one way or the other? Yeah, so the the B rate on earnings is is above the long term average, but below the average over the last four quarters. Although the percent by which companies have beaten is uh, decent, but it's the the top line number where the beat rate has been um, well below long term and shorter term. So I think the real key is the companies that have been beating on the bottom line, particularly if they haven't beaten on the top line. It's largely because of of cost cutting methods in order to protect margins. So I think that. That's part of the underlying story. But we are looking at about a 10% growth rate, and that excludes the big one-time charge for Bristol-Myers Squibb. It would be two or three percentage points lower than that. But since that's one company, one time in nature, I'm using more the the 10% number. But we're not seeing much movement in terms of extrapolating that better than expected first quarter into the latter part of the year. So I, I still think the outlooks are important. And then as has been the case in recent quarters, companies, stocks of companies that have uh, missed earnings are getting disproportionately hurt mm -hmm. relative to the reward accrued to companies um, outperforming expectations. So it just tells you that the market's in a little bit of a skittish state. Yeah. I mean, sometimes those drops, like I'm on the closing bell and we report earnings and man, sometimes yeah. that punishment that is an understatement. <laughs> yeah. So 
If we yeah. like a little bit too bit and too bill and chill, I've been trying to come up with something really clever and it's not happening. But like large and lush, like is it <laughs> large caps and bust? Like is that is that where you have to just I think it's focus? Uh, yeah, I I think where the where the factor focus needs to be in things like interest cover, strength of balance sheet, strong free cash flow to enterprise value, high return on equity does tend to generally correlate up the cap spectrum, but that doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities outside of those mega cap areas. And that's why we continue to think you want to have that factor orientation around some of those characteristics that I that I just men- mentioned. I think what you really want to avoid is the ultra low quality zombie company, not mm. profitable segment within indexes like the Russell 2000. Uh, Lizanne, talk to us about valuation. What's your call here? Um, you know, we've had a big run up off those October lows in the stock prices. Earnings, as you mentioned, have come in better than expected. Uh, is that enough to support valuation here? Well, last year was a year where, the, at the at least at the index level, the, the market did quite well, but we had very little earnings growth. So most of last year was valuation expansion. The, the recent drawdown that we got in the S&P and the NASDAQ and to a greater degree indexes like the Russell 2000, um, that was largely multiple contraction because we're now in positive earnings territory, although importantly not for the Russell. We're still in negative territory. Mm-hmm. So I, I, valuations are on the rich end of the spectrum, but as I always say, much like I say, about sentiment, um, valuation is a terrible market timing tool. <laughs> you could talk about it as a backdrop. Markets are still fairly rich, but that is not the same thing as it's sending a message that you need to sell stocks because of rich valuation. Valuations can get rich, sentiment can get frothy, and it can stay that way for quite some time, as we all learned in the late 1990s. Yep, absolutely. All right, Lizanne, thank you so much for joining us. As always, Lizanne Saunders, folks, she is a chief investment strategist at Charles Schwab. We appreciate getting a few minutes of her time. We have lots of Fed speak out today, three, two Fed speakers, 11 this week. That's Those are really going to be the main event. We also have some ECB speakers uh, talking today as well, talking about how rates will be lowered gradually over time. One is looking at three interest rate cuts uh, so far this year, and again saying that the ECB is independent of Fed decisions and that the impact will be contained on the euro area. Let's get more insight into all of this. Jackie Bowie is managing partner and, he- and head of EMEA uh, firm Chatham Financial. Um, Jackie, do you, do you agree with that idea that, look, the ECB can cut three times. The Fed can do what they want. The ECB in Europe is going to be relatively insulated. No problems. Yeah, there certainly seems to be um, some transatlantic divergence in monetary policy. um, And that really reflects the very different economic conditions in the US versus Europe. You know, we've been talking all year about the strength of, of the US economy. You know, despite all those rate increases in the last two years, the economy has been very resilient. In the euro area, um, it's the opposite. The economies are extremely weak. The UK had a technical recession at the end of last year. So the divergence in monetary policy, I think, reflects those underlying economic conditions. So, Jackie, let's start with with the UK. What is the Bank of England saying these days? What does the market believe the Bank of England will do? Well, there's certainly an expectation that a rate cut is coming um, early in the summer. So we have the Bank of England meeting um, this week, uh, so we'll get the announcement on the 9th of May. The market is really now pricing in a hold um, for this meeting um, and the first cut to come um, slightly later. And I guess that's been the story all year with all the central banks where, you know, the Fed and the um, ECB and the Bank of England, we were all expecting these quite significant rate cuts to come. And what has happened is the timing of the first cut is getting pushed further out and the extent of the cuts being reduced down. It's the same story for the Bank of England. But, you know, come May 19th, there could be a savior in Europe that will help growth and maybe boost inflation. What is that? She goes by the name of Taylor Swift. Oh, boy. (laughs) And I say that jokingly. But there was an argument that Taylor Swift's concert schedule in the U.S. last year did a tremendous amount for the economy, and many economists have actually put numbers on it. She kicks off her European tour uh, May 9th. Do you think it's going to materially help, like services spending, really help boost growth or at least provide a floor? Joking, but serious question. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, interestingly, if you look at the two sides of the economy between the manufacturing industrial side and the services sector side, the services sector side has actually been holding up slightly better. And that's the argument um, as to why inflation hasn't come down quite so much across Europe, um, that that services sector wage inflation has been slightly sticky. So if we get the Taylor Swift effect here in Europe, actually it's on the wrong side of the economy. What the European mm. economy especially Germany, um, is an improvement in the heavy industrial construction side of the economy. So talk, give us an update, Jackie, on, on Germany. We, we, we know that that's a challenging situation. They have kind of the double whammy, the exposure to Russian from the energy perspective, and then number two, their um, you know, exposure to China on the export side. Where is the German economy now, and, and how are the, how's the European Central Bank viewing Germany? Yeah, so there has been some um, flash data just in the last few weeks, which is showing um, a little bit of signs of recovery, but it's very marginal. And generally, you know, economists are still saying this isn't the start of a recovery trend. And um, but you've hit on the the exact two points. Germany's getting squeezed. They have they're very dependent on um, energy coming from elsewhere, Russia. You know, pre the war, those energy prices. Now the year on year increase in those prices is coming back down, but they're still quite inflated. And as you say, it's an export led economy led by um, heavy industrial, the auto sector. And we're going to have a whole other conversation about the EV market and what's happening there, but Germany's really stuck in the middle. So you're right, the European Central Bank has a bit of a dilemma because the peripheral European economies, so Portugal, Spain and Italy, are actually doing a bit better. Mm -hmm. Service sector, tourism, um, but then the biggest economy in Germany, obviously not doing quite so well. So trying to find a monetary policy stance that can fit both those scenarios is, is, is pretty challenging. What's interesting, though, is that President Xi Jinping didn't go to Germany. So it went to France and then going to Hungary, basically other countries that have a tangential tie, in essence, to Russia. Do you make anything of the fact that President Xi did not go to Germany? Um, I didn't read into that too much. I'm sure there might have been an underlying message there, but certainly in the in the London headlines this morning, it was very much all around, um, you know, the Chinese French relationship and how this could be, you know, a bellwether for China and the rest of Europe. It seems like a bit of a leap to take it to that conclusion, but certainly that's the way it's being reported here in London too. All right, Jackie. Given that background, that central bank background across Europe, where are your clients when you talk to them? Where are they most comfortable allocating capital these days? Well, Chatham really works and much more in the you know, the private capital market. So we have a lot of clients who are heavily invested into real assets, so real estate yep. and private equity infrastructure. There certainly is still um, a fairly negative view on big parts of real estate across Europe, and that's completely related to where these interest rates are. You know, combination of the valuation of those assets and also the cost of debt to borrow and to fund new investments. So still quite a bit of negative sentiment there. I would say that on the other side, what we would call the infrastructure assets, so that's everything that sits within renewable energy and big public sector infrastructure. That's certainly where we're seeing clients raising new capital and allocating into those um, alternative energy and infrastructure sectors. So anything in the public markets that also relates to that, I would say, is where capital is being allocated. What are your clients most worried about then right now? Refinancing debt at higher rates of interest. Um, and and when is that going to come down? Yeah, that's a, it's a fair point. And when does that strike for them? Um, it will be the second half of this year. Mm. So there's been, there was a little um, half tongue in cheek phrase about in real estate that you just had to stay alive until 25. Um, and that would mean <laughs> that interest rates were coming back down and you would be able to refinance. Now that is correct. The interest rates will be lower in 2025 than they were at their peak of 23, but they're still going to be significantly higher than they were at the origination of some of those loans. So this refinancing avalanche, as it's being described, will really start to hit the second half of this year and into next year. So there's been a little bit of a delay of some of those borrowers refinancing as they wait to see what the interest rate market looks like in the second half. 
All right, Jackie, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Thank you for your time today, Jackie Bowie, managing partner at Chatham, uh, joining us there on Europe, the UK, what clients are worried about. You're in T-bills, you're making $2 million a minute. And by you, I mean one, the general investor. (laughs) I would love to make $2 million a minute. Uh, Here with more is Ethan Devitt, uh, Chief Global Market Strategist over at Moneta. Um, Ethan, T-bill and chill. When you're taking a look at Treasury paying out $2 million a minute, what do you make of that? It's where we have been. Cash is no longer trash. It's a great place to stash money and to sit on dry powder. That has certainly been the case for the last 18 months. Um, However, we've seen investors get a little uncertain about that, especially with the FOMO we've seen around equity markets and inflation staying high. That cash yield, remember, after inflation, what we're thinking about isn't quite as compelling, but it has put pressure on bond substitutes. So things like infrastructure, real estate, defensive stocks, they are all suffering from this. But as we can see from the rally in markets, it isn't making any dent in the desire for growth participation and some of those higher octane stocks. You know, I saw over the weekend that out west in Tahoe, the skiers, they got like two or three feet of snow over the weekend. They're gonna be skiing until like July 4th here. And that (laughs) was picked up by Ethan. How do you equate the snowfall out west to your market call, Ethan? It's funny, I I always look for parallels in real life and we've had a bit of a surprise. I love skiing, I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but I do love it. And just what they've said about the, I follow all the ski resorts and they're saying as long as possible. They're staying (laughs) open as long as possible. And that's that open-ended, the joy that the spring skiers see. I saw a parallel to that with some of the rhetoric from the Fed last week's meeting that they will leave rates high essentially as long as possible. So there's going to be um, not much certainty in terms of the timing of rate cuts. Um, And just like the snowpack is looking at 130% of its median, we still have inflation at 130% of its average. So it's around 3%, whereas we would hope it'd get closer to 2%. That's at least the target. So we're not there yet. Um, some are making hay uh, in the ski slopes, but for the Fed, it's that open-endedness of it, which I thought didn't seem to spook markets. I thought it would actually. Markets have been surprisingly resilient. I even thought that the jobs number on Friday not being as robust would spook markets. It seems to have had the opposite effect and that markets seem to have taken from that, that the pressure on labor is going to be more subdued, that 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 lead in to the inflation point is going to be less of an issue. And then maybe we will get to that soft landing, no landing scenario that they've been thinking about. So markets just seem to be incredibly resilient, like the snow, snow resorts right now. <laughs> is, it, is it weird to get snow in May like that? No, or? no, it okay. is crazy out there. They've had some good snow. But when, when it snows in Tahoe, it snows huge because they right. get the storms from off the ocean. Right. So that's not weird. But keeping rates this low at the data may be weird. I mean, uh, this high, I should say, like this high versus the data. Like, is that weird? Is that sort of an anomaly um, that financial conditions, for example, continuing to get looser? You take a look at SLU, Senior Loan Officer Survey, and lending standards aren't as tight as they might have been in other times in the cycle. Like, that's weird, no? It is. I mean, it's interesting. I think that the Fed right now is looking at the inflation number, looking at this ongoing tightening that they're doing behind the scenes by slowing their purchases and actually trying to offload part of their balance sheet. So that is a tightening measure. So they really are continuing to tighten. And as inflation falls, those interest rates will start to to pinch more. And simply the fact that the longer these high rates are in effect, the more consumers and companies will be forced to refinance. So that transmission effect is going to start to bite even more. So even though they're doing nothing, it's still a pretty pretty tight environment. And the question is, you know, how long can consumers stick with that? Um, And, you know, we're already feeling the cumulative effect of inflation that hasn't gone away. We're seeing the gas price increase at the pumps and this geopolitical uncertainty that is just swirling in the background. And as the U.S. election nears, it's going to get more and more noisy there, not only domestically, but it seems, unfortunately, internationally. So I do see um, quite a lot of risks there to this market resilience. But and, and as you said, there isn't really that loosening that look to kick off anytime soon. Right, given that background, Ethan, where are you suggesting your clients allocate capital these days? We're definitely more interesting to hear just about the notes from Warren Buffett about AI. And clearly this concentration in markets around AI and technology, we can't ignore that. We've never had a strict thematic approach. 
we've always been believers in more of a core broad based approach we were encouraged by some of the sectors that rallied in the first quarter it was pretty much across the board we had strong performance we're also encouraged by a suggestion that a cut in rates when it finally does happen will be good for mid cap and small cap stocks hmm. so that should end again add some breath to this rally which has been very large cap focused so we're, we're pretty keen on equities still as before, we've always been diversifying. Right now around real estate, we're a little hesitant. We haven't seen the movement in prices to suggest we're at a bottom yet. So real estate, we'd be more hesitant. But as far as picking sectors, another thing we're exploring is around just how digital assets are maturing. We're taking a look at Bitcoin 2.0, we're still on the edu education phase. There's a lot to learn about how that behaves in a portfolio. But since Warren Buffett seems to think that this is a casino economy that we're in, um, we need to know what the odds are at that casino and to try to put a little bit of fundamental research behind the kind of red black conundrum that investors may feel they're facing. Which pairs to the point that Paul and I talked about Friday that Dave and Buster's is allowing some gambling when it comes to yes. physical stuff uh, in their restaurants. Total side note, but nonetheless, I would put money on myself for skee ball versus Paul, but you know, Ooh, whatever. Um, <laughs> you mentioned uh, even small cap stocks, for example. Um, if the Fed does wind up cutting, does that mean you expect that to be more of a normalization versus the economy is struggling, therefore I must cut, therefore small caps make sense? I would think so. I mean, small caps have really been on the back foot for a long time. They've got very little attention. They've never seen that kind of rally. They would have been pinched by inflation, less pricing power, high interest rates, just generally less leverage at the, at the bank with banks, with credit providers. The one thing that might have been good for small cap stocks recently would have been the M&A trend, which is around this buy just simply acquisitions by large conglomerates, they would have been trying to buy up some stocks. So a few tailwinds, but mostly headwinds. Yes, I would think that they will do well if the economy remains strong and the Fed does a normalizing rate cut. Clearly, if we're in economic woes, that will be hard for small caps, the mom and pop shop generally doesn't do well in that environment. So it's it's not a very high conviction call, I'll have to say, <laughs> but it is um, relating to just a reversion to the mean, some kind of normalization as to how these sectors and, and cap uh, segments perform. Right. Ethan, thank you so much for joining us. Ethan Devitt, Chief Global Market Strategist at Moneta Group. All right, folks, your daily look at the front pages around the world. Lisa Mateo, what do you got for us today? All right, it was something we were talking about earlier, and you mentioned it too, Alex. The Boeing spacecraft set to carry the astronauts for the first time tonight. So it's the Starliner blasting off 10.34 p.m. Eastern from Florida. Two astronauts to the International Space Station. They're going to return them to Earth about a week after, but it's really going to test whether it's ready to ha handle like these NASA um, missions. But it's it's been a struggle. The project led to a $1.4 billion accounting losses for Boeing. Um, but it could be good news. I mean, Boeing could use some good news, right? It's facing all the safety issues with its airline business. Um, but yeah, this is, this is happening tonight. So let's well, I'm an astronaut. Am I a little nervous getting on a... I, uh... <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I mean, I think if you're an astronaut, aren't you kind of used to these yeah. things? True. Um, I mean, apparently Boeing has around one and a half billion dollars in extra costs to cover these Starliner delays and technical problems, and you would hope that they would all be uh, sussed out. Also, I didn't know this, but uh, the ULA rocket is uh, partly owned by Boeing and Lockheed Martin. So I just thought that was really yeah. interesting, and they're both thinking Good about choice. trying to like spin off that stake in 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 this Pentagon and contractor, but it hasn't happened yet. I just found that interesting, also in terms My of my son those works at Lockheed Martin. Yeah. I'm not allowed to know what he works on. Really? Yes. Nothing? He's only 28. That's so cool. <gasps> he's on a need to know basis. Yeah, and he, te he tells me, you don't need to know, Dad. So I was like, okay. Wow. I'm sure he savors that. <laughs> yeah. He savors that. Anyway, I still I, pay I'm... for his phone bill, though. Oh, yeah. oh, that okay. might have to stop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know. I feel like that. Uh, and the Netflix, too. That's yeah, a little sketchy yeah, there. Yeah, I think we took care of the Netflix. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to that. Uh, that's going to be super fun to, just to see how that all goes. Um, Lisa, what else are you interested yeah, in? Yeah, so this is what Paul is right up your alley with the Paramount. Um, this is the New York Times said that since those Skydance talks ended, that a special committee, their Paramount's board of directors, they signed off to begin deal talks with Sony Pictures Entertainment, Apollo. You remember last week they bid that offer for the company around $26 billion in cash. Uh, so we'll see where this goes. You know, they, 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 if they'll push further for negotiations with Skydance, too, on top of this. So it's kind of opening it up, opening up the bidding. Yeah, know. this one feels more real to me. You've got a real strategic player in right. Sony. 
Uh, you've got a real financial player in Apollo. So you think they can come up with the money. You think they can add value there. I don't know what the regulatory environment is for putting two big stu studios, the Sony studio mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, Paramount studio together. I'm sure there's going to be some regulatory review there. But this one feels a little bit more real. The question comes down to, will this deal result in a premium paid to Sherry Redstone and her controlling shares. That's what she wants. Right. Um, and will she get it in this transaction? We'll have to see. Apparently, the Financial Times, though, reported that James Cameron and Ari Emanuel are actually backing the Skydance bid. Uh, Whether or not that uh, actually means something material is something very again, different, but they both uh, came out in favor of that. Both players, but they're not in this realm. In this, I think you need some seriously deep pockets like yeah. Apollo and some serious strategic value like Sony can well, bring. Well, I wonder if Skydance would come back. I mean, yeah. sweeten the deal. Yeah. Could they sweeten it even sure. more? <laughs> yep. Who knows? Um, did you go to the movies this weekend? That's what I wanted to ask you guys. Did you no, see anything? No, but I really wanted to see Fall Guys. Okay, there you go. <laughs> and I mean, you're not the only one who did not see it. Fall Guys. <laughs> uh, it's uh, Ryan Gosling. Ryan oh. Gosling, yes. He yeah. plays like this action star. Um, but it didn't do well at the box office. So it was a $125 million production, Comcast Universal Pictures. It brought in just $28.5 million oh. domestic box office over the weekend. I mean, you thought he brought in the boost for Barbie, but it didn't do it with this but one. I will see it. I you, okay, <laughs> I you promised that weekend. They could use you. I mean, you got Emily Blunt, Ryan Gosling, yes. and Hannah Waddingham. I mean, I don't know what more you could possibly want. You get cheesy romance. You get things blowing up. Yeah, this see, movie was for literally see? made for Alex Steele. <laughs> Yet you did not go. You did not Yet you did not watch the Derby. It's what true. did you do this <laughs> what weekend? Did what did you do this what weekend? Did what did I do? do? I did some Pilates and I slept. <laughs> what did good, I do good. on Saturday? Oh, I played a ski ball. I played ski ball on Saturday with my daughter at Industry City. In wow, that's, fun. that's good. Okay. Yeah, so let's just, Paul and I, we both like the ski ball, so yeah. I, I, I got a, we'll I got get, a couple we'll, thousand. We're going to get Alex down to the Jersey Shore this summer to the people boardwalk a little ski ball. I tell you, if, so the question <laughs> is, will any Shore. movie this summer make well, a billion dollars in box that's office? That's the thing. I mean, they said there's two big, there's Inside Out 2, which might be, maybe you'll take yeah, your daughter, sure. that one. And then there's also Deadpool and Wolverine. Oh, oh, Deadpool. So, a Deadpool, I love. <laughs> okay, guys. Sorry. Okay, guys, I know, I, big I could talk fan. for like hours. I mean, Deadpool and Wolverine, I will like take the day off work. Yes. I will like stay overnight. Yes. Like I oh. will hustle to see this movie. And who's yeah. who's the Deadpool guy? He's the other Ryan. Yeah, the other Ryan. Ryan Reynolds. Ryan, 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 Ryan Gosling, yeah. Ryan Reynolds. Both from Canada. Hilarious. Both really funny. Not for the kids. Both funny. Definitely. <laughs> I know. I think that the rumor is that Taylor Swift is supposed to be in that. So no. that makes my daughter really, really, really excited to go see it. And we're like, sorry, no, kid. Like, there's Why like, is it R? Yeah. It's like R+. Plus. Oh. It's like, it's like not freaking. Really? Okay. Yeah. Imagine all, all the cursing and anything inappropriate is in this movie, which is <laughs> yeah. why it's so good. Very good. All right. <laughs> ABC um, News. Oh, last thing. Yeah, ABC News President Kim Godwin stepping down. Um, this was a big thing that came out Sunday night. She sent an email out to staffers. Um, she was named president in 2021. She worked for CBS before that. They don't know who's going to take over um, from here on, but it, it, it was a tough role. Like it, it just says there was it was a cutthroat, toxic work environment. That's what people were saying. Um, Good Morning America ratings kind of went down a bit, but... Um, it's a tough position. All right, ABC but. News. I mean, it's you know you wonder where in the world of streaming and cord cutting and you know where is yeah. the investment in broadcast network? News? You tell me. Uh, yeah, I know. It used to be <laughs> obviously it used to be the real pride and joy of a network was your news organization, whether it's CBS, ABC, NBC. Um, but now with you know declining viewership due to cord cutting, what's the investment that those businesses require? Right, I, you know, right. I don't know and. Uh, so that's interesting there. So. And it did. They just did a lot of restructuring in February, so it took a lot of, away of her management type. Um, okay. But this is also so. very difficult because you need the you need the day to day stuff to feed the content, to feed the beast for streaming mm. and for digital, right? Yeah. But it can't just be that. Right. You need so uh, what that balance is. I don't. I don't think yeah. anyone's figured that out. Podcast. But isn't, it, but isn't that what we're running around? Uh, yeah, the but business? then it's only podcast, and something has got to give. Everyone gets a podcast, you'll dilute it. I know, exactly. All right, Lisa Mateo with the newspapers. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in economics, geopolitics, finance, and investment. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show. Weekday mornings from 7 to 10 Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.